many Russian oligarchs donate to the Conservative Party? What were the Bidens doing in Ukraine in 2015? If you're a, a man of principles... Yes. Why are you working for a man who the anti-corruption authorities say has stolen all this money from the people of this country? His son, Hunter, was the well-paid director of a controversial energy company. Can we make a serious point? I mean, I think that... Well, if this there, is a if, serious if there, point. Yeah, sure. I mean, if it's there, about if Russian there are... interference in UK politics. In 1991, when the Gulf War was taking place, French sociologist Jean Baudrillard declared that the Gulf War was not taking place. What he meant by this wasn't that all the violence and death being experienced by the people of the Gulf was not real. But to the American public, whose military were actually waging the war, the horrific violence appeared simply as a spectacle. I think if Bolger was alive today, he'd say the invasion of Ukraine is the only thing taking place. What's been remarkable about Western coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is its success in conveying the brutality of war in a way that resonates with a jaded, media-saturated, COVID-fatigued public. This is, to be honest, what the media should be doing all the time. And it's amazing to see, just with pure political will and the public on side, what can be achieved in the world. Suddenly, billionaire oligarchs are no longer untouchable. Oil companies are putting morality above their own profit motive. An increase in gas prices? Not a problem. I don't mind if poor people in the UK freeze to death, just as long as poor people in Russia do too. And then there's refugees. The more the merrier, apparently. I distinctly remember being told there wasn't any room in the UK. Basically. Well, I don't care. We'll have to find room. Okay? Pardon? We'll have to find room. But they have to be Ukrainian, and they certainly can't be people who were displaced by British military action. But the unique way in which the war is being covered shouldn't be confused for the war itself being anything unique. The sad reality is that Putin's war is no more vicious or deadly than all the other wars that the media tacitly support, or at least allow to pass by unnoticed. And though few expected a full invasion of Ukraine, especially after US intelligence briefed that that's what was going to happen. As a rule of thumb, you should expect the opposite of whatever US intelligence says is going to happen. The sad reality is there's been war in Ukraine for years. Today, Ukraine's president met in Paris for the first time with Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Both sides are agreeing tonight to pursue a ceasefire in a war that's killed 14,000 people. And escalation at some point was unfortunately pretty much inevitable. And so what's hidden behind this, though noble cause of portraying the brutality of the war, is that the singling out of this one war as unjustifiable, in a world where so much other violence apparently isn't, creates the impression that Putin's actions are somehow uniquely beyond the norms of modern international conflict, when the sad reality is they're quite in keeping while other conflicts are explained away as complex geopolitical maneuvers and clashes of ideology, or when it comes to the US and its allies, simply as blunders, the war in Ukraine, far from being explained away, is not allowed to be explained at all. The violence and murder occurring in Ukraine is framed as so utterly different to any other violence and murder occurring around the world that the only conclusion you can come to as to why it's happening is that Putin's mad. Putin's mad. That's, that's it. I didn't realise that's how geopolitics worked. Didn't, didn't realise it was that simple. Yeah, I've just finished my PhD on the causes of the Second World War. After four years of research and note-taking, I've managed to edit it down to a single sentence. Hitler was mad. Can I have my doctorate, please? Putin's mad, and what do mad people do? Well, apparently, they invade Ukraine. If Putin's so mad, why didn't he invade the moon? And why didn't he do it 10 years ago? 
What's interesting to know about the Putin is mad narrative is that even though everybody is well on board with this, definitely that's the key issue in what may decide the fate of mankind. It's interesting that nobody actually wants to investigate it or even discuss it. So I thought, let's, um, let's roll with that narrative. I'm on board. So let's get into it. Um, when did he go mad? <laughs> Was he mad when Western leaders such as Clinton and then Blair backed him in the early noughties? Was he mad when, when he invaded Crimea? Did he stop being mad in 2019 when he sat down with Ukrainian President Zelensky for talks? And then did he go back to being mad in the last month or so? What kind of madness does he have? It would be nice to hear from a psychiatrist. Have we got any leaks from Russian generals and those close to Putin about his madness? What are the symptoms? No, nobody actually wants to discuss Putin being mad or the history of that madness because that would involve discussing the history of Russia's relationship with Ukraine. And no one actually wants to discuss the history. No one actually wants to discuss the situation at all. If Putin's so mad, why didn't his generals just say they've invaded Ukraine and then show him old movie footage? How's the war going, comrades? Oh, it's going great. Don't worry about it. Also, we won the boxing, as you can see from this footage here. Because it seems to me that Putin's litany of bullshit to justify this war, whether it's because he wants to de-radicalize the country, or it's because Ukraine are harboring chemical weapons, or the promise that Russia has achievable aims and that the war will be short and simple. It seems to me that Putin is acting in the exact same way as every fucking leader who has ever gone to war. I'm not saying Putin isn't mad. In fact, I'm sure he is. But that doesn't explain this war. It's more just a sign of the times, isn't it? Speaking of which, how about that Zelensky guy, eh? Do you remember those movies from the early 90s in which a new neighbor or work colleague befriends the protagonist's family? And despite them clearly being very sinister characters, everyone falls head over heels for them. And as the main character becomes more and more suspicious, of this random sinister figure in their lives, their family starts to turn on them. Stop being so judgmental of this clearly really really nice person that's entered our lives. Do you remember these kind of films? I feel like there was an abundance of them in the early 90s, but maybe it was only Pacific Heights and Single White Female? And actually thinking about it, I'm not even sure either of these films follow the exact formula I'm talking about. I remember Arlington Road from 1999 was kind of like an ode to that era. Oh, and there was that movie a few years later where the daughter is actually a middle-aged woman. Do you remember that one? Anyway, it's a timeless story that in my mind encapsulates what's happening to anyone that speaks out against Zelensky at the moment. Because it's my understanding that leaders, prime ministers, presidents generally are quite compromised figures who often lie to their own people. But apparently, this Zelensky character that, let's face it, none of us knew anything about until a few weeks ago, is just the, the greatest leader of all time. He's just absolutely the best politician that's ever lived. And so, what a cruel twist of fate it is that it just so happens to be at a moment when Ukraine has the greatest leader of all time that the country has wound up in a full-scale war with its neighbour Russia. I get the impression that Deep down, what a lot of people think has happened is that the really evil character of Putin just couldn't stand his neighbor's virtuous nature and he had to destroy him because Putin has to destroy anything that's beautiful. I, I really do think that is deep down what people's actual political analysis of what's going on is. But I mean, I just can't get my head around why no one seems even remotely disturbed by the fact that Zelensky's basic argument is that because Putin's invasion is wrong, Ukraine should not budge an inch when it comes to Russia's demands, even if that means the entire country being leveled. But this is exactly the problem with blindly supporting one side and never questioning their judgment on anything. The problem with the narrative that Putin is mad 
and Zelensky is basically the prince that was promised, is, well, apart from the fact that it's ridiculous, that it makes all discussion of the political situation leading up to the war appear as an irrelevance, while simultaneously exacerbating those exact political tensions, i.e. militarization in Europe, a call for greater NATO expansion, and more hatred of Russia and individual Russians. This analysis is like seeing a group of teenagers getting wasted on a Friday night and thinking, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? They are completely unlike any other teenagers I have ever come across. Look at them, drinking more than their constitution can handle. What would possess them to do such a thing? And now they're throwing up. It's unbelievable. I can only conclude that these kids must be crazy because their behavior is completely at odds with normal teenage behavior, there must be something specifically wrong with these individuals because they're acting in a way that defies all societal norms. Most teenagers never ever even touch alcohol. They have no interest in alcohol. Alcohol plays no part in their lives whatsoever. So this is very, very strange. I fear someone watching this video will misunderstand what I'm saying here and conclude that I'm saying it's not crazy that many teenagers drink to excess. But my point is that it is many teenagers. It's not just one or two people who are crazy. It is a craziness that comes around in our society when people are teenagers. It's a societal problem. And so to single out one individual and say, hey, you, why are you doing this? Why are you getting so drunk all the time? Is a ridiculous way of looking at the problem. And this is a key difference between the right and the left. Because before coming up with the drunken teenager metaphor, I went through a few other systemic problems in society, such as knife crime and homelessness, and realized that it's really hard to use any metaphors because with all problems in society, a lot of people actually do think that it comes down to basically individuals being a bit mad. But the really mad thing is, is that you can actually present the dry data on systemic problems. And people will totally accept that this is the reality, but will still at the same time somehow keep hold of the belief that it's purely down to the individual. Take unemployment, for example. This is often framed as a problem caused by people just being lazy or unable to get their shit together because they're lazy. And even when the government itself puts out a forecast on how joblessness will rise by a certain percentage due to economic factors like stagnant growth or less trade or whatever, people still instinctively see it as tied to laziness. So you get this weird jumbled up notion that thousands of people are predicted to get super lazy in the first quarter of the year, but following that, people will one by one stop being lazy as the job market improves. It's completely idiotic to try to explain away the problems of the world through individuals being lazy or mad. And of course, many of the people who profess to hold these opinions don't actually believe it themselves. I suspect at this point a picture of Rhys Mogg is appearing on the screen. I'd just like to point out that I'm not saying that Mogg definitely doesn't believe this. I'm just saying that some people like Mogg don't. Because for people like Mogg, the most important thing is that you believe it. Because if the reason Putin invaded Ukraine is because he's mad, or the reason there is a homeless person sleeping outside your tube station is because they're mad, or even that you yourself find it difficult to get well-paid work or struggle to pay your bills, then it's because of your own laziness slash irrational slash mad decision-making ability. Basically, you're mad for getting yourself into this mess. And it's important that you believe that because in that case, it has nothing to do with Mog and the Johnson government he is currently entangled in. Mog, he's not here to help you out. He's not here to, to try to structure a society in which there is less homelessness and less poverty. That's, that's entirely up to you. Mog's just an amusing British eccentric, a bit like Johnson himself or Jimmy Savile. And you can't expect these people to do anything about your laziness or declining mental faculties, but they are amusing, <coughs> which is, at least quite a nice distraction from the continuing decline in living standards that you're experiencing at the moment. It's like Sunak is handsome, right? 
So if he were PM, then at least you'd get to look at a nice face on the TV all the time while you're slowly drowning in debt due to your lazy, crazy lifestyle. What more can we ask of these people than to be handsome and amusing? Wait, what was this video about again? Oh yeah. So the difference between Putin's invasion of Ukraine and other wars, let's say our wars, no, no, let's say your wars, not my wars, is that our wars, I mean your wars, were justified or arguably justifiable, you know, to some degree. I mean, think about it this way. We're calling for Putin to be put on trial at The Hague right now, only months after giving Tony Blair a knighthood. So at the very least, you have to admit there's, there's a disparity there, right? So my question to you is, under what circumstances would Russia invading Ukraine be justified? Because we've established, right, that war is taking place all over the world, all the time, and many wars are supported by, started, or entirely conducted by the US and its ally, the UK. Uh. So we live in a country, in a system, in a government, in a society that does see going to war sometimes as justifiable, even if it is always immediately regretted. So when is it justifiable for Russia to go to war? Is it justifiable for Russia to ever go to war? Presumably yes, if it's justifiable to have wars, which apparently it is. And if it's justifiable to have wars, like who does, why, why can't they have war against Ukraine? What is it uniquely about Ukraine that they, they shouldn't invade? And you might say democracy, but we're already getting far away from where the actual conversation is, right? We're not saying that, well, you know, it, if Ukraine had less democracy, then obviously it would be totally fine for Russia to invade. Of course, democracy plays a key role in deciding the legitimacy of some countries over other countries. Although not always, because obviously you have countries like Saudi Arabia, which are a security partner of the US and UK, and are deeply undemocratic. But it can often be used to say, well, these countries are legitimate because of their democracy. And yet at the same time, the US, which openly on both sides of the house, for very different reasons, obviously claims that their own democracy isn't functioning properly, that Russia of all countries is influencing the democratic process or that the democratic party deep state are fixing elections. So should we be allowed to invade the US now because their democracy is not functioning? The point I'm trying to make is that there is clearly a massive double standard here, right? The US can pretty much justify wars wherever it wants and get some kind of Western backing, even though they're basically just dictating policy to the world, right? And Russia can't really go to war ever because anytime they do, it's completely unjustifiable. Imagine if Ukraine had decided to make a pact with Russia and allow Russia to put military bases on the border of Poland. Some people might say that that would be an act of aggression and that the US and NATO would be quite right to then invade Ukraine. Now, I personally wouldn't say that. I would say that if US military bases were established in Ukraine and had missiles pointed at Russia, that still wouldn't justify invading the country. But that's because I'm coming from an anti-war position and not an anti this particular war because it's unjustifiable, unlike the other wars that we fight position. And I think it's because I'm, I'm different to a lot of you. I'm not necessarily better, but I am. <laughs> I'm different and I'm better, let's face it. Which is where people like Keir Starmer are coming from. Starmer is not anti-war. In fact, he hates the anti-war movement. Starmer is anti this war because it goes against Western foreign policy objectives which themselves are often pro-war. There's a lot, of, a lot of US foreign policy has led to war, right? We, we can agree on that. And so it's difficult for people like Starmer to wholly condemn what is happening in Ukraine without revealing a double standard about how major military powers, basically the US and Russia, are viewed by the international community, i.e. the West, which is international, but not global hence its name, West. And so just as it's important for people like Mog to convince us that every struggling individual we come across is just a lazy, crazy person whose circumstances are entirely due to their individual decision-making, 
I'd say that also that's of some importance to Starmer as well. But anyway, it's also very important for Starmer, and to some degree Mog, that we don't discuss the war in terms of an overall systemic problem in which geopolitical disagreements and security concerns from time to time lead to military action. It's important to people like Starmer that we see this as the war of an individual's madness. Because if we were to look at war as a systemic problem throughout the world, we might start to question some of the industries and organizations that are built around this recurring theme. And we might start to question whether the most powerful government in the world and the most powerful and influential alliances in the world are at least somewhat to blame for this near constant problem that we face. People can't believe there is war in Ukraine, but I would suggest to just look at a map. Look at where all the US bases around the world are located and then look at where they're not. Then follow the line between the two. And if you go down, you'll come across Georgia and then Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now Russia occupies Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan have been sporadically fighting for years. And then below that, what do we find? Syria, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. But it doesn't end there. Oh no, because then we have the other great enemy of the US, the other great power that is outside of American empire, outside of the West, and that is China. And nearly all of the human rights issues and the occupied territory that China, well, occupies, follows this same line. And though it would be a massive oversimplification to say that the reason that nearly all of these places are continually bombed, invaded, sanctioned or occupied is solely because they lie on this fault line between US empire and Russia and China, between, you might say, the East and the West. It would be equally misleading to ignore this issue completely, but ignore it we do. And the reason isn't because we don't buy into enough Russian propaganda. It's because we're constantly bombarded by our own propaganda, by Western propaganda, by US propaganda. Uh. I stand for the United Nations and respect international law. But now Putin is trying my patience. Never seen such war crimes before, except Libya, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine, Syria, Yugoslavia, Chile, Nicaragua, Indonesia. But if Vlad won't listen to reason, we'll just have to start a nuclear war. So love me, love me, love me, I'm a liberal. We needed to deal with Saddam. And Gaddafi needed to go And to protect the Albanian children It was right to bomb Kosovo But NATO is purely defensive And that's something traitors would know Like you, so love me I march to stay in the EU But when it comes to backing Zelensky There's no one more red, white and blue So love me, love me, love me I'm a liberal No war but class war The enemy is at home Long live international solidarity